People who didn't know each other received invitations at the same time. They were a secretary, a nun, a sheriff, a mercenary, a judge, a general, a rich boy and a doctor. After arriving by boat on this isolated island, they were greeted by two butlers. They had traveled a long way but had never met their master. But they didn't think much of it. They were led to the villa by the butlers. With excitement and doubt, they stayed there for the time being. A terrible game awaited them. When they returned to their rooms, the secretary found a strange nursery rhyme on the wall. She didn't think much of it. Didn't know it was in every room. It was a sign of what was to come. They still hadn't seen the head of the family at dinner time. They began to wonder what was going on. What's even more bizarre is that when they asked the housekeeper whether the master of the house had called to tell them anything, the housekeeper said there was no phone in the villa. If the master had any instructions, he would ask the postman to bring a letter. So now they are truly isolated. They felt that the invitation was strange, but they couldn't leave now. So they began to guess the identity of the master. At that moment, a voice suddenly came out of the villa's radio. He accused them all of crimes, including the butler and the servants. Looking at their puzzled expressions, the butler said he didn't know who was speaking. They followed the voice to their room and found it was a gramophone. That means it was recorded in advance. But was the accusation of murder on the radio true or not? If it's true, it's a party for the killers. Just thinking about it makes your hair stand on end. At that moment, the butler appeared with the fainted maid in his arms. Facing their puzzled looks, the butler said that the maid had fainted from overwork. He carried the maid away, followed by the doctor. But the maid was obviously knocked out by the butler. Why did he lie on purpose? You see the mysterious master of the house? Back in the room, the doctor prescribed medicine for the maid. The maid didn't dare to take it until the butler nodded. And he lay on the bed trembling with fear. He seemed to know the butler's secret but didn't dare to say anything. And after taking care of the maid, the butler told them he didn't know the contents of the gramophone. He just played the records according to the instructions. And the master of the house said in a letter, it was just a surprise game for them. Faced with accusations that were made up out of an air, they didn't think the game was funny. They wondered what kind of conspiracy was going on here. Did the master invite them here just to play a boring game? Game? The answer is, of course, no. They begin to discuss the victims mentioned in the broadcast. Some said it was a false accusation. Some said they didn't know the victim. At this point, the mercenary confessed to the charges. He did kill 21 villagers in Africa. So they started accusing him of being a butcher. To their surprise, the mercenary said, I'm the only one in this room who's telling the truth, aren't I? Who knows if it's true or not? As long as you don't admit to the accusation, as they were about to continue their argument, the judge suddenly spoke up. There's no point in arguing over ridiculous accusations. For now, all we have to do is go back to our rooms and sleep. We'll wait quietly until tomorrow when we leave the island. If we see the head of the family, we'll confront him then. At that moment, the rich kid suddenly remembered something. The Rado accused him of killing two people. He was driving drunk and cute to kids, but he blamed them for running off the road. As he said that, he took a sip of his drink. Next thing you know, the rich kid's face turns ugly. Then he started spitting blood. He died on the spot in front of their horrified gazes. Everyone realized that the party was not as simple as they thought. This party is not as simple as they thought. On the other side, the maid was having a nightmare. She saw the butler kill an old man. The old man was the victim killed by the butler. Obviously, it wasn't her dream. That's why she's so afraid of the butler. A knock on the door woke the maid. The maid asked who it was, but got no answer. The next morning, the housekeeper told the doctor that something had happened. The maid was strangely dead in her room. The doctor examined the body and confirmed. The maid died a few hours ago. So who killed the maid? Could it be the butler? After all, he's the prime suspect. The doctor left the room and ran into the secretary. The secretary said, I saw something strange in the parlor. She took the doctor to the living room and told him. The ten soldiers on the dining table had turned into eight. This corresponds to the eight people still alive in the villa. The original ten corresponded to the ten soldiers in the nursery rhyme. The secretary suspects that the nursery rhyme has a special meaning, but the doctor thinks it's just a coincidence. At breakfast, the secretary asked the others if they had touched the soldier dolls, but they all said they hadn't. So who took the missing dolls? Could it be the mysterious murderer who never showed up? The rich kid and the maid couldn't have died for no reason. The secretary thinks they were probably poisoned. The doctor was the last person to touch the maid and gave her a sedative. So the secretary to the secretary's analysis, they begin to suspect the doctor. In order to prove himself, the doctor asked them to check the medical bag, but it's just some mild sedatives. In other words, he had nothing to do with the maid's death. Without any clues, they can only wait for the boatman to arrive. No matter who the killer is or what his intentions are, as long as they get off the island safely, 
This can all be over. While they wait, the mercenaries suspected that the head of the family was hiding on the island. They just never found him. The mercenaries and the sheriff searched the entire island, but they still haven't found any other trace. On the other side, the general told the secretary, the boatmen will never come and no one will come to save them because this island is the end of their lives. The secretary had no idea what the general was talking about. She was convinced that the boatmen would come for them. After saying that, the secretary turned around and left. Not long after that, the nun saw a flock of birds circling over and over. It seemed that there was something down there. The nun went to check it out, but she saw a scene that sent chills down her spine. The general had been killed here by someone. They worked together to bring back the general's body. The sheriff could tell from the wounds that it was a deliberate murder. But who was the mysterious murderer? There was no one else on the island but them. Is the murderer among them? Before they knew it, the secretary passed by the dining room. The eight soldiers had turned into seven. No one but the secretary believes that the murderer followed the nursery rhyme. People kept dying in the villa, together to discuss who the murderer was. The mercenaries still think it's the master of the house. The sheriff said that the more dangerous a situation is, it means unknown, which means that the name is unknown. It seemed like a riddle, so the judge agreed that the mercenary was right. Whether the mysterious murderer was the head of the family or not, it must be on the island and among them. By this reasoning, the sheriff believed that the murderer was the butler. He had a feeling that something was wrong with the butler from the beginning. The others agreed with the sheriff's theory, but they didn't wait for the boatman today. So they went back to bed. In the middle of the night, the doctor and the gong went his search for food. He found that the butler had been murdered. The secretary saw the scene and vomited straight away. Now the butler's tragic death means the mysterious murderer is not him. And the butler's death corresponds to the lyrics of the nursery rhyme. Only six out of seven remain and there are only six survivors left. It was only then that the doctor realized the secretary had been right all along. The murderer was indeed killing according to the nursery rhyme. In other words, all of them will die. After learning the truth, one more person had died. The secretary rang the gong to alert the others. The nun was found stabbed to death in her room. The death of the sixth soldier and the nursery rhyme. Although everyone knew that the murderer had followed the nursery rhyme, but there was nothing they could do about it because no one knew who the next victim would be. Then. After disposing of the butler's body, the mercenary returned to his room and found his gun missing. Someone had broken into his room, but who was it? Even more puzzling, the door was locked, so how did the person enter and leave? The mercenary suspected that someone must have a master key. This key is most likely on the butler's body, and the person who found the butler's body was the doctor. So the mercenary thinks the doctor stole his gun. The doctor said it's all just his personal speculation. We can't confirm the existence of the master key now. The mercenary's gun was stolen by him. Maybe he's the one who killed the others. There was an immediate argument between the two sides. The sheriff take the key and steals his gun. But all these are just their own speculations, without any substantial evidence. All of them could be suspected of stealing the gun. To find out the truth, they searched all the rooms together, but they didn't find the missing gun in any of the rooms. So where's the missing gun? Does it mean that the murderer is not one of them? The search was fruitless. The mercenaries began to suspect that the murderer might be a judge. When the judge was in office, he didn't just like to impose the death penalty. He would go to the execution side to watch it being carried out. So the judge and the killer had something in common. The secretary was not interested in participating in their discussion. Instead, he planned to go back to his room to rest. But shortly after, a scream suddenly came from the room. The mercenaries and others arrived to find the secretary passed out in the room. With the help of a doctor, the secretary soon came to her senses. The secretary said she thought there was someone in the room who had fainted. They didn't think much of it. Instead, the doctor noticed that after hearing the secretary's screams, why the judge didn't show up, realizing something was wrong, they rushed to the study. They realized that the judge had also been brutally murdered. The mercenaries were wrong. It wasn't the judge. The judge was killed by a gun that was stolen from him. The four of them went to the dining room. There were ten soldiers on the table, but now only four remain. Just the right number for the four of them, who will be the next to be killed. They don't know if they'll die tomorrow. They decide to stay up all night and enjoy their last moments. After the party, the four of them went back to their rooms to rest. Not long after, the sheriff heard something outside the door. He cautiously opened the door to check. He saw the doctor sneaking out of the villa alone. The sheriff realized that the doctor was the murderer. He found the mercenary and told him and the secretary what had happened. They chased the doctor in the direction he left, but they didn't find the doctor for the rest of the night. The mercenary returned to the room and found the missing pistol. He wondered how the murderer had done all this, but after the mercenary told the sheriff and the secretary, the sheriff said that perhaps the mercenary's pistol had never been lost. It was left on the bed after the murder. To clear his true identity, either that or the secretary helped the mercenary put the gun back in his room after they left last night. After all, they're a couple now, who knows if they'll work together against the sheriff. More importantly, when they were looking for the doctor last night, 
they acted separately. The sheriff suspects that the doctor was killed by the mercenaries last night. While the two were arguing, the secretary said, And he's still alive because people don't just vanish. Not on an island this side. He's still alive. The secretary thinks the doctor is the murderer. It's impossible for a living person to disappear from such a big island, but the truth is far from simple. Watching the others die in mysterious ways, the police chief couldn't take it anymore and confessed. He said the accusations on the record were true. After hearing the sheriff's confession, the mercenary and the secretary were not surprised. How to get out of here alive is the most important thing now. The sheriff calmed down. According to his experience, they must be under surveillance. That's how the murderer knew what they were doing. They decided to leave the villa and go to the sea to see if they could find a boat. But after the mercenary and the secretary left, the sergeant was left alone in the villa in a vain attempt to find the dreaded murderer. When they arrived at the beach, the sheriff didn't come out with them. The mercenary had to return to the villa, but all he could see was the tragedy. Before he could think, the secretary arrived. Yes, Walking in the sea. A big bear had one in In a matter of moments, the sheriff had been killed. The mercenary, the secretary and the missing doctor were the only ones left. Was it really the doctor who killed them? The secretary and the mercenaries went to the beach again. They found something on the beach. They went to check it out cautiously. The body of the missing doctor appears. This rules out the possibility that the doctor is the murderer. The secretary and the mercenary are the only ones left on the island. In the eyes of the secretary, the murderer is the mercenary. She grabbed his gun when he was about to dispose of the doctor's body. She said she knew he wanted to kill her, but the mercenary says he didn't mean to kill anyone. The murderer was someone else and on this island. The mercenary was killed alive by the secretary. The secretary became the only survivor. After killing the mercenary, the secretary returned to his room in the villa. At that moment, there was an extra rope on the ceiling. The secretary knew that the murderer had prepared it for her. She knew there was no way to escape. She didn't hesitate to put her head into the rope. At that moment, the door was suddenly opened. It was the dead judge. The mercenary was right. It was the judge who was behind all this. The doctor helped the judge to fake his death to fool them. He wanted to team up with the judge and leave alive together. He didn't know that the judge was the real killer. That night, the doctor left to meet the judge, but he ended up killing himself. The secretary learned the truth but didn't understand why. The judge said, in the name of the head of the family, I invite you here. On the one hand, I do enjoy killing. On the other hand, all the invitees did commit crimes. Only the sheriff, the mercenary and the rich kid confessed. The doctor, who caused the death of a patient in a botched operation. And the nun, one of her housemaids was pregnant out of wedlock. The nuns thought the maid had violated the church's teachings. The maid's pleas for help were ignored leading to the maid's tragic death. As for the secretary, she was a teacher of a boy. The secretary fell in love with the boy's uncle. In order to help her boyfriend get his inheritance, she drowned the boy. That's the crime they were accused of by the judge. Although the crime was true, there was no evidence to prove it. That's why they managed to escape the law. In the judge's opinion, they had to pay for their crimes. So he came up with this perfect massacre. He wanted to personally send these sinners to hell. Instead of feeling guilty, the secretary begged the judge to let her go. She could blame the mercenaries for everyone's deaths. That way she could get away with it. Along with the judge, how could the judge let such a ridiculous thing happen? Without waiting for the secretary to say anything more, he took away the stool and watched her go to hell. In the end, the judge chose to shoot himself, leaving such a murder case a permanent mystery because the head of the family who invited them to the island did not exist. With the judge's death, no one will know who the murderer is. The woman just wanted to see if the nanny was bullying her daughter. She didn't expect to see her dead husband on the monitor, but her husband died a few days ago. How could he be on the monitor? She was so scared that she rushed to her room. She asked her daughter if someone had hugged her, but her daughter hadn't learned to speak yet and could only shake her head. She went to her husband's room to check her suspicions. She didn't realize that a piece of clothing was missing. Maya heard a noise downstairs and looked towards it. The nanny pulled up in front of the house. She asked the nanny to check the court fee to make sure she wasn't mistaken. She asked who the man was, but the nanny wouldn't answer. She asked Maya to get a glass of water. Maya, in her quest for the truth, the so, when she turned around with the water, the nanny sprayed her in the face with the Maya fell to her knees and the nanny ran away. Maya called the police immediately. When she was about to show the police the surveillance camera, she realized that the nanny had pulled the memory from the camera. The nanny obviously had a big secret. Maya's husband might not be dead. The police didn't believe Maya's story at all because her sister had been cute before. They think she's hallucinating because she's so upset. But Maya always felt that her husband was still alive. She had to go alone to find out the truth. A man was shot and killed, but then he appeared on the surveillance 
surveillance cameras. Maya wanted to find out the truth. She called her mother-in-law to find out what happened. The mother-in-law saw her husband for the last time. She wanted to know if her husband was dead or not. Granny got very angry when she heard that and said she must be sick. She told her to see a psychiatrist. Maya couldn't understand her mother-in-law's words. She obviously found her husband in the surveillance camera. But the nanny unplugged the memory, and she had no proof that she had seen her husband. She settled her daughter and went to the nanny's house. The nanny wouldn't open the door for her. Maya looked through the glass and saw a pot cooking. The nanny's obviously running away from something. Maya was worried about this. The mother-in-law calls again. She asks Maya why she's hitting the nanny. Maya knew immediately that the nanny had complained. She told her mother-in-law to keep the nanny. She rushed home to question the nanny. As she was about to arrive at her doorstep, the nanny's car just passed her. Maya chases after the nanny to retrieve the surveillance memory. She tried to retrieve the memory card but was stopped. By the time Maya reacted, the nanny had already escaped. Maya is furious and finds her mother-in-law. She asks why she let the nanny go. The mother-in-law asks why she spied on the nanny and beat her. Grandma thinks Maya must be sick. Maya is very angry because of the statement, but then she was left speechless by her mother-in-law's questioning. The mother-in-law asked her if she loved her son. If she did, why did she kill him? It turned out that the mother-in-law had already realized Maya had a reason to kill her son, but she had no proof. At this point, Maya stopped pretending. The girl sat her day on a chair and drank water. A man suddenly appeared behind her. She was thrown down hard on the table. He immediately took out a knife and killed her. Maya was her sister. She was very angry when she found out about it. She knew it was her husband who killed her. Joey needed to pay. Maya called Joey on purpose to set up a meeting. She wanted her husband to explain the circumstances of her sister's murder. Joey heard Maya say that he was her sister's killer. He tried to kill her. Maya thought he might kill her, so she changed her gun. She saw that Joey wanted to kill her right away. Maya realized that he didn't love her at all. She pulled out her pistol and the bullets hit him. He was hit by the first two before the third killed him. She avoids suspicion by lying on top of Joey. She makes it look like he's clinging to her as he dies. Then she pretended to be sad and cried out for help. She lied to the police that they had been robbed. Her husband died tragically. In her attempt to destroy the evil one, Maya slipped into her mother-in-law's estate. Then, she revealed her mother-in-law's plan directly to her face. Turns out, she didn't like her all along. She only cared about her son. She knew he killed someone. She pretended she didn't know anything. She even arranged for someone who looks like Joey to appear in the court fee. She asked the nanny to unplug the surveillance memory to drive her crazy. Unexpectedly, Maya was about to drive her mother-in-law crazy. Maya confessed to her murder in front of everyone. She wanted to force them to cure her. Sure enough, they killed her as soon as they found out. When they were about to dispose of the body, Granny found a camera. What they did was broadcast live. Everyone knew about their murder. They were arrested for intentional homicide. Maya also avenged her sister's death. Detective Poirot wanted to get some rest. Instead, he received a letter from London urging him to return. He asked the receptionist to book him a ticket for tonight. Behind him, a man called out to him. The man was the chairman of the Orient Express and a big fan of Poirot's. When he learned that Poirot would be traveling on the Orient Express, he assured Poirot that he would take care of the tickets. But the receptionist who booked Poirot's ticket just now told him that the Orient Express is fully booked for tonight. In desperation, Poirot said he could leave tomorrow. But the chairman insisted that he could help Poirot out. After all, he is the chairman of the train. Little does Poirot know that he is about to be implicated in a murder. So, he goes to the station with the chairman, but the conductor tells him that there are no more seats in the train. The train soon reaches its departure time. The chairman realized that there was a passenger who had arrived, so he gave his seat to the detective. Poirot was able to board the Orient Express. Immediately, he notices a strange atmosphere. He passed the first compartment, where a woman was crying. In the second compartment, a rich businessman was staring at him discreetly. The steward leads Poirot to the target carriage. There's a man in the same car with him. The steward settles Poirot down and leaves, but no sooner had he left than he was summoned by the rich businessman. He wanted a list of all the people on the train. Obviously, there was more to him than that. The next day, Poirot came to the restaurant to eat. He was enthusiastically introduced to the passengers in the train. A guy now ecologist, a Hungarian diplomat, a Russian lady and her maid, and a female missionary. Among 17 others, Poirot was not interested in others. After breakfast, he went to the bar for a drink. Unexpectedly, the rich merchant found him and threw him a pile of money. He wanted to hire Poirot to keep him safe on the train. He suspected that someone was planning to kill him. Poirot didn't want to get involved in his business and turned him down. He had no choice but to leave. At night, the train stops in the middle of the journey. The steward told Poirot, your separate compartment is ready. It's next to the rich merchants. While sleeping, Poirot is awakened by a scream. It seems to be coming from the businessman's room. Poirot carefully opens the door to see what's going on. The steward is asking the businessman what happened. Mr. Ratchet, is everything all right? Yeah. 
Poirot is about to go back to sleep when he is awakened again. It's a train that's crashed into a snowdrift. Quaro sees who the steward is talking to. He asks him what happened. The conductor said that his wife felt that someone was following her. The next day, the train couldn't go on. Everyone was stranded in the middle of nowhere. There was a knock on the door of Poirot's room. He opens the door. It's the chairman, looking at him in a state of panic. Poirot realizes that something terrible has happened. He goes to the next compartment. The rich businessman has been murdered. Poirot wants to know the cause of death and asks the doctor to examine the body. A preliminary examination showed that he'd been stabbed 15 times. Poirot asked how long he'd been dead. The doctor said it was about 7 to 8 hours ago, between 12 and 1 a. M. The door of the car was locked. The doctor thinks the murderer must have escaped through the window. Poirot didn't give his opinion. He thinks it's a matter for the police. The chairman said, if the murderer can't be found before the police arrive, all of them will be detained. More importantly, as the only intercontinental luxury train, the passengers are almost all rich and powerful. He begged Poirot to help him. Eventually, Poirot agreed. Poirot quickly disproved the doctor's suspicions. The train stopped at the last night, based on the time of the murder. If the murderer did escape through the window, there would have been footprints in the snow. But there were no footprints. That means the murderer must still be on the train. Maybe he's one of them. Poirot told the chairman to call it in. He'll question them all later. In the meantime, Poirot found a broken pocket watch. The time on it reads 12.40. That matches the doctor's estimate. Strangely, the doctor said there were 15 stab wounds, but he only found 12. And these stab wounds don't seem to have any rules of attack. There's no way they could have been inflicted by the same person. Poirot suspected that there were at least two killers. But why did the doctor hide the number of stab wounds? Could he be involved in the rich businessman's death? Poirot continued to look for clues. There was a burnt piece of paper in the ashtray on the table. He deduced that it contained a clue. That's why the killer burned it. To confirm his suspicions, Poirot used a special method to reconstruct part of it. It was two incomplete words. It's a clue, but it's not valuable at the moment. Poirot had to look at the passengers to find a new way in. He first questioned the stewards. What happened on the train last night before the murder? Before the stewardess could speak, the chairman of the board said, the steward was the hardest worker in the company since his wife's death. They've made the company their home. The chairman was worried that Poirot would see the stewardess as a suspect. But Poirot only believes in evidence. He asked the stewardess why his wife died. The stewardess said his wife couldn't accept the death of her daughter. She took her own life. The attendant was a poor man. Poirot didn't ask any more questions. He asked him to tell him exactly what had happened last night. The steward said when the train stopped at a station last night, he got off the train at one of the stops and rested for a while. It was so cold that he soon returned to the train. Besides him, Two other passengers also got off the train, but they didn't stay on the train for long. After that, they chatted in the car until 2 a.m. In other words, they didn't have time to commit the crime. At half past two, Madame found him and told him that there was a stranger in the room. The detective knew about it. Poirot continued, Did you see a woman in a red nightgown? After the train stopped, Poirot woke up. He opened the door and saw a woman walking towards the bathroom, but he only saw her back. The steward also saw her. Again, only her back, but he didn't know which carriage she came out of. The woman went into the bathroom and didn't seem to come out. What's going on here? Is the murderer the mystery woman? Poirot asked the stewardess to leave. But then, the chairman said the stewardess wasn't on the train, but came here on a special shift. The chairman's words made Poirot suspicious. The stewardess said she had to see a friend so she could only go on this train. The reason made sense. Poirot didn't think much of it. He asked the bodyguard for his impression of his employer. The bodyguard said, the rich businessman is nothing but a rich scum. He only works for him because he's rich. He didn't have a good impression of him, but there was no conflict. What's more, he didn't leave the carriage last night. He didn't leave the car last night. He can't be the murderer. The rich businessman's translation assistant was next. The assistant said, the tycoon was in need of an interpreter. He was short of money, so he's been working for him ever since. Poirot asked him if he knew the businessman's address. The assistant didn't know, but he felt the tycoon had a secret. He's been running for his life for years. In addition, the tycoon had received many threatening letters. He kept all these letters. How much was in the uh, suitcase? Over $200,000. Oh. <laughs> Hearing the $200, 000, 000 in the assistant's words, Poirot understood at that moment. The tycoon was now using a false name. He had committed a kidnapping for $200,000. Five years ago, he kidnapped a little girl named Daisy. Although the girl's parents paid the ransom, but after receiving the ransom, the culprit killed Daisy. When Daisy's mother learned of her daughter's death, she couldn't accept the reality and went into premature labor. Not only did the newborn baby not survive, the mother also lost her life. In addition, Daisy's father also chose to commit suicide. At that time, the police suspected that the murderer might be the nanny. The nanny committed suicide in order to testify against herself, and the murderer took six lives. The two words Poirot restored 
are actually the little girl's name. The murderer may have killed the rich businessman for revenge. The police had actually arrested him, but his family is very powerful in the area. The prosecutor and judge tampered with the evidence. The murderer was eventually acquitted before everyone could react to the shot. The wife burst in and said she saw the murderer with her own eyes. It was the woman in the red nightgown. Poirot immediately asked the chairman to tell the others the truth. He told them to check everyone's suitcases to see who had a red nightgown. The assistant was nervous and said he didn't know what to do. His father was the prosecutor in the case. He was worried that Poirot would soon suspect him. He didn't know who he was when he was working for a rich businessman. But will Poirot really believe his testimony? He's not a murderer. Why should he worry about being suspected? On the other hand, the wife told Poirot, last night, she was sleeping. In the middle of the night, she saw a dark figure standing beside her bed. When she woke up, he went out, but it was so dark, she didn't see who it was. As soon as she finished speaking, Poirot asked her if she knew Daisy. She said she'd heard about Daisy's tragedy, but at the time, Daisy's family was high society. She wasn't, so they didn't have any contact. If she had known that the rich merchant was Daisy's murderer, she would have cut out his heart, like all mothers do, to see if his heart was red or not. That's when the doctor found a button. It looked as if it was from the stewardess dress. The doctor immediately deduced, if this button is not the stewardess, then it must be the murderer's. Poirot made no comment. The doctor continued, the murderer disguised himself as a stewardess when the train stopped. He used a stolen key to open the carriage and enter the victim's room. I'm left hand, right handed, it is all coming together in my mind. I'm very pleased for you, Mr. Poirot didn't agree with the doctor's assumptions, but he didn't refute it too much. He asked a woman if she had ever been to America. The woman said she had been there to preach. Before she could say more, the chairman interrupted her. The woman was about to get up and leave. Poirot stopped her again and asked if he were Catholic. Suddenly, the woman became agitated and said, All Catholicism is false. There are sins in the world that should never be forgiven, like those of the victim. After that, the woman turned and left. Why did she hate him so much? Without waiting for Poirot to think about it, the chairman of the board told him they had found the missing to hundred dollars zero 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 only madame wore pyjamas in the whole carriage but they weren't red but the chairman noticed something strange about madame's clothes today she looked very swollen poirot immediately called madame again madame said she was listening to the maid reading last night and fell asleep until 1 20 in the morning she didn't feel well so she asked the stewardess to call the maid at this point the maid agreed she waited until she fell asleep by that time it was about 2 30 a.m and the victim had already been killed. Poirot then asked if Madame knew the Daisies. Madame had stayed at Daisy's estate and had become godmother to Daisy's mother. She was the daughter of a famous actress, and Madame had always been fond of her. Poirot suddenly interrupted her. He knew that artists had stage names, and what was her real name? Madame replied that her real name was Waterstones. Besides Daisy's mother, she had a young daughter, but she didn't know what had become of her. Poirot asked if she knew that the victim was Daisy's murderer. Madame said angrily that if she had known his identity, she would have tortured him to death. As they delved deeper into the investigation, the detectives discovered when they learned the victim's identity, they all wanted to put him to death. Is it possible that everyone on the train is a murderer? This gives Poirot a headache. But his instincts tell him that Madame must have something to do with the victim's death. But it's impossible for one old man to do it all. Poirot said goodbye to Madame and called her maid alone. He asked her if she'd been to Daisy's house. The maid answered in the affirmative, then quickly denied it. She only knew Daisy's house because she'd worked next door to her. That's how she met her present wife. Looking at the maid's nervousness, Poirot knew she must be hiding something. He tentatively asked, I heard you used to be a very good cook. The maid quickly smiled at the compliment, but she soon realized something was wrong and denied it again. She kept emphasizing that she was just a maid. Poirot saw the maid demonstrating her expertise in cooking. Obviously, she's lying. The maid senses Poirot's suspicion of her and immediately explains. She keeps saying the wrong thing because she saw the murderer last night. Poirot asked the maid to describe the murderer. According to the maid's description, the murderer was short, solidly built and dark-skinned. After listening to the maid's testimony, Poirot was even more certain, but he didn't ask any more questions. He already had an answer for the murderer. Afterwards, Poirot questioned the others. The conclusion was, almost everyone on the train knew Daisy and her family, or had heard stories about them. After a round of questioning, Poirot had a vague idea of the truth, but he hadn't yet found the proof. At night, Poirot began to think, maybe the doctor was right. If the murderer was disguised as a stewardess, the shirt with the missing buttons must still be on the train, and it was hidden in the least expected suitcase. That person was the maid who claimed to have seen the murderer. When Poirot sneaked into the maid's room, Poirot found the dress with the buns off. He also found a photo album in the suitcase. It contained photos of her with Daisy's maid. Only, she was a cook at the time. At this point, 
Poirot knew the whole truth, he gathered them all together, but before they could say anything, Poirot began to tell the truth about the victim's death. Everyone in the carriage was a murderer. They wanted to avenge Daisy's family. They were also avenging themselves because they were all involved in Daisy's case. Poirot was looking at Madame's passport and noticed that her name was blurred. Madame had deliberately drawn his attention to her first name and not to her last. Her surname is the same as Daisy's mother's. In other words, the Countess is Daisy's youngest daughter. Poirot also deduced that the maid who died to testify was the stewardess' daughter. Her ladyship's maid was Daisy's cook, so as not to arouse Poirot's suspicion, she deliberately concealed her identity. In the others, Daisy's tutor was implicated in Daisy's kidnapping and was seriously injured. Others were Daisy's father's comrades in arms, even the doctor, who had been helping was one of the murderers. The doctor witnessed what happened to Daisy's family. The assistant was arrested because the victim's family had put his life on the line. His family threatened his father with his life and altered the evidence, which led to his father's death. So he wanted to avenge his father's death. The most surprising thing is that the wife is Daisy's grandmother. Her identity is so special that she had to make a disguise. Seeing that Poirot had deduced the truth, they didn't hide anymore and confessed directly. They confessed that their previous statements were just to mislead Poirot. Then, Madame told the whole story. On the night of the murder, the assistant trod the wine to keep the victims conscious while they were unconscious. Madame then led them to the car. While the victim was conscious, they stabbed him separately. No one knows who actually inflicted the fatal wounds, though the victims were scum. But after confirming the truth, Poirot angrily accused them of flouting the law, that they had the audacity to take the lives of others into their own hands. He told them, if everyone did justice this way, then society would only go back to barbarism. Poirot felt that no one was above the law in any name. He angrily asked the chairman to lock the gates and hand them over to the police tomorrow. The chairman tries to plead for them, but Poirot only cares about justice. Daisy's father's comrade suddenly pulls out a pistol and tries to kill Poirot. His mates rush to stop him. If they kill Poirot, what's the difference between them and the victim? He then calmed down, seeing this scene. Poirot also began to waver. He didn't know if it was right or wrong. The next day, everyone got out of the car. Everyone was ready to suffer the consequences. At that moment, the local police finally arrived. To everyone's surprise, Poirot handed over his shirt with the buttons off. He told the police another answer. Then he turned his back on them and left, without leaving a word. But at that moment, the silence was deafening. After a whole night of thinking, Poirot went against his principles. He became their accomplice. He is the owner of a company. He had a good career and a good family, but he was framed for murder. To win the case, he hired a lawyer named Goodman. She's never lost a case since she became a lawyer. When Goodman arrived, Mark was surprised. She was three hours ahead of schedule. Goodman explained that time was of the essence. The police have found a witness and were going to convict him tonight. Mark had to tell the truth about the crime. Otherwise, she wouldn't be able to defend him in court. Mark's recollection, he was in a secret relationship with Laura. On this day, Mark received an anonymous text message. He was blackmailing him for $100,000 for their relationship. Otherwise, he would expose their scandal to the public. Mark agreed to his terms. According to the location of the deal, they went to the hotel, but after waiting for a long time, they never saw him. Eventually, they lost patience and were ready to leave. At that moment, Mark was suddenly attacked and fainted. When he woke up again, he was terrified. Laura had died in the room. The police suddenly break into the house. Mark tried to explain that he didn't do it, but the police searched the whole room and didn't see anyone. Besides, the room was unlocked, and the hotel windows are always locked. There's no way someone could have disappeared from a secret room. Mark was arrested as a suspect then released on bail. Goodman found out what happened. Mark always claimed he was being framed. She wondered why the killer would frame Mark. If it was just blackmail, why kill and frame him? The killer didn't take the money when he left. It wasn't about the money. Goodman could see that Mark was lying. There must be a secret. <laughs> Goodman took out a newspaper. Mark is agitated as he reads the news about the missing teenager. Goodman pressed Mark to reveal his secret. Three months ago, Mark and Laura had a date at a hotel. On their way back, an animal suddenly crossed the road. Mark couldn't avoid it and collided with a car. They went to check it out. The teenager was already dead. Mark was terrified and was about to call the police when Laura stopped him. If they call the police, people will know about their relationship and then they would be ruined. Sonia, tu hija, tu carrera. After thinking it over, Mark chose to compromise. But when he was about to run away, Mark's car wouldn't start. Laura spotted a car coming from the opposite direction. The driver asked if they needed help, seeing that the whole thing is about to be exposed. Laura pretended to be a teenager who had a collision with Mark. She told the driver that they were working on it. At that moment, 
A mobile phone rings from the teenager's car. Laura lied that it was a call from the insurance company. She runs to the car and pretends to talk to the insurance company. Laura noticed the blood on the ground and quickly covered it with her body. The passing driver didn't notice anything unusual and just left. Laura stuffed the teenager's mobile phone into her pocket. Then they hid the body in the boot. Mark went to dispose of the body. Laura stayed put and waited for help. As night falls, Mark arrives at the lake. He calms down, pushes the car and the body into the lake. As the car sinks, He's devastated and blames himself. On the other side, Laura met an older man. Laura said her car broke down. The man drags Laura's car towards the garage. Unbeknownst to Laura, the nightmare begins. Upon arrival, the uncle begins to repair Laura's car. The uncle's wife invites Laura into the house. They were talking when Laura saw the photo on the table. The teenager they had run over during the day was their son. She looks panicked and wants to get out of the house. That's when the old man tells her that the car has been repaired. Laura was about to leave when the boy's mobile phone rang in her pocket. She remembers that she forgot to take care of the phone. But it's too late. Laura takes it out and it's the uncle's wife. The ringing alerts the couple and she hides the phone. The uncle finds his son's phone under the sofa. The wife remembers her son taking the phone out of the house. Laura leaves in a panic, saying it's getting late. The uncle follows closely and sees Laura off. She gets into the car and makes a move that catches his attention. He wrote down the license plate not knowing that his son had been killed. The woman he just sent away is the murderer. Laura told Mark what had just happened. At Laura's suggestion, Mark destroyed the car and forged a business trip record and called the police to report his car stolen. After all this, they agreed not to contact each other again. They thought their plan was perfect. But what happened to the teenager? soon aroused the police's suspicion. The police thought the boy had fallen off a cliff in a car accident. Mark looked at the agonizing uncle and blamed himself. He didn't know that he was already suspecting Laura. Laura was strange that day. She seemed to be avoiding something. Uncle told the police about it and that they spoke on the phone before his son disappeared. But when Laura arrived at his home, his son's mobile phone appeared under the sofa. Following the clues, the police soon tracked down Mark because the car she was driving was registered in his name. Mark was prepared for this. The evidence of his fake trip and the missing car played an important role at this critical moment. Mark was able to clear his name. Afterwards, Mark asked Laura to meet him. Laura had changed her face. She was no longer the woman he knew. Mark told her that the police had been looking for him. Laura was very calm when she found out. She took the boy's wallet and discovered he was a bank employee. So, she transferred a large amount of illegal money into the boy's name to mislead the police into believing that he was a fugitive from justice. The news reported that the teenager had embezzled the money and fled. Mark and Laura were cleared of any wrongdoing. Next, their lives returned to normal. Mark's company successfully entered the Asian market. He was named Entrepreneur of the Year. Everything seemed to be going well. But then the uncle suddenly came to question Mark. He suspected that his son had been killed because his son would never do anything illegal. He couldn't have stayed away from him for a long time. He concluded that his son's disappearance was related to Laura, and there must have been other people with the woman at the time. He remembers it clearly. She got in the car and adjusted the driver's seat. Obviously, the previous driver wasn't a woman. Uncle's guesses that Mark was the driver at the time. ¿Dónde está mi hijo? That's the truth, but Mark still has to be calm. After all, Uncle has no direct evidence at the moment. At this point, the uncle's identity was recognized and he was kicked out. After Mark's story, Goodman figured it all out. Estando ella muerta, solo les queda usted. Mark always believed Laura's murderer must be a passing driver because he received an anonymous photo and it looked like the river where he dumped the body. The passing driver must have followed him, photographed the crime, and then blackmailed him. He heard a strange noise when he pushed his car into the lake. Goodman doesn't think so, assuming that the driver was only in it for the extortion. But why didn't he take any money with him? And how did he manage to get out of the escape room? Obviously. Mark's testimony is full of holes. It's not enough to convince a judge in a court of law. Goodman deduced that only the uncle had a clear motive for the killings. He knew his son was killed by Mark and Laura. He didn't kill for money. He killed for revenge. Mark wondered how the uncle could have framed him so perfectly. Goodman was quick to answer. She pulls out a newspaper of Mark's arrest. The uncle's wife, an employee of the hotel, walks in. It's obvious that this is an elaborate plan by the couple. The uncle entered the room where they had an appointment. He succeeded in committing the crime and framed Mark for it. Then he escaped through the route laid out by his wife. After the police entered the room, the wife locked the window of the room, and it all made perfect sense. Mark listened and admired her. From this moment on, Mark trusted Goodman completely. He and his team of lawyers had long suspected the uncle. Goodman took the initiative to bring up this clue. 
She's a top lawyer, but she suddenly disproved the uncle's clue. Uncle's wife wasn't at work at the time of the murder. As for the photo of the uncle's wife in the newspaper, look closely at the reflection of the woman in the mirror. Actually, that's not the uncle's wife. Goodman put the photo there on purpose. If Mark uses it to prove himself, he'll definitely lose. Goodman is testing whether Mark is telling the truth. Obviously, Mark is still hiding the truth. Goodman got a call. The police found a witness in the form of a passing driver. Mark was terrified when he found out. Once the driver testifies, Mark's guilt will be confirmed. Goodman's job was to pin the disappearance of the teenager on Laura. Su único delito será el encubrimiento bajo cargo de conciencia. She asked Mark the most crucial question. ¿Dónde lo sepultó? Fue aquí donde le sepulté. Goodman gets the answer and walks to the window. Looking across the street, that's when Mark reveals his new secret. Creímos que había muerto. Se lo juro. Pero lo había llevado todo tan lejos que no había vuelto atrás. No se mienta más a sí mismo. Usted es un asesino. Goodman is furious at Mark's behavior. She suppresses her anger and regains her composure. Goodman can't help Mark get off, but she must know the truth. Quiere que el juez crea que no es un asesino. Pues entonces, admita de una vez que mató a la otra. Goodman offers to take a 10-minute break. After she leaves, Mark gets a call from his assistant. The assistant says he's paid off a witness, the driver who was passing by at the time of the murder. At that moment, the phone seems to be jammed by something. ¿Qué demonios ha sido eso? Félix, ¿me oyes? Ni usted es más listo que yo. Mark understood everything and looked across the street. Goodman was actually the uncle's wife. Mark panicked. But it was too late. His crime was perfectly recorded. The doorbell suddenly ran. El señor Doria, soy Virginia Goodman. On the other side, the uncle called the police. And the truth is not that simple. On the day of the murder, Laura offered to call the police, and Mark offered to dispose of the body. Afterwards, Mark made it look like the teenager escaped. It was all Mark's idea. Laura suffered from depression after her separation from Mark, perhaps because of her guilt over the boy's death. Laura couldn't let go of it all the time, so she told the uncle and his wife the truth. Afterwards, Laura lied to Mark. Their crime was seen by the driver and blackmailed her. Laura wanted to make it up to the uncle and his wife, but when Mark arrived at the hotel, Laura confessed everything. She didn't expect that he would cure. Afterwards, Mark faked the scene and pretended to be the victim. It was all an act he put on himself. A man pulls a bee out of his ear. A bee crawls out of his eye. Then, a large number of bees come out of his mouth. The man couldn't take the torture anymore and crushed his head. At the same time, a couple of parents were preparing to burn their daughter in the oven. The daughter woke up and kicked open the oven door and ran for her life. But the parents weren't going to let her go. The mother gagged her and they pulled her into the oven to prevent her from escaping again. The mother taped the oven shut and quickly turned on the gas. The temperature inside the oven rose rapidly as it burned. In the nick of time, the police broke down the door. When she saw this, she pushed her mother away. She cut the tape and saved the girl, but they didn't give up on the idea of killing the girl. The father shot off his pistol, and the mother was ready to attack. Luckily, the police managed to subdue the father and stop the mother in time. Afterwards, the girl's parents were locked up in a mental hospital. As to why they killed their daughter, the mother gave the following answer. Since the birth of her daughter, the original family of ten had a series of accidents. Eventually, only the husband and wife were left. They thought she was a disaster. So they were going to kill her. Rita came to visit her in the hospital. Seeing her poor face, she decided to adopt her. However, a bad luck was about to come. The next day, she went to the girl's old house to pack her things. She found a pit in the basement. It was supposed to be a grave for the girl. What's even stranger? Inside the girl's parents' room, she found several locks on the door. As if to resist something, on the other side, the girl has recovered under Rita's care and made a new friend at school. However, something horrible happened immediately. Rita learned from a colleague at work yesterday. The girl's new friend came home and brutally killed his parents. Rita immediately went to the crime scene. From the bloodstains, it was easy to tell that they were killed in their sleep. But strangely, he doesn't know what happened. He was very sad that he had killed his parents. Rita didn't suspect the girl. Until the day the police found their phone records, it showed that a call was made from Rita's house just before the accident. Okay. They went home and asked the girl if she had made the call, although the girl did not hesitate to deny, but the sheriff saw that the girl was lying. In order to find out the truth, Rita asked him who made the call. As he was about to answer, he suddenly had trouble breathing. Then he lost consciousness and fell to the ground. When he woke up again, 
Rhea finally got the answer. It was the girl who called, but he couldn't remember what she said. But why would the girl lie? That puzzled Rita, so Rita called a psychiatrist to treat the girl. To get her to open up, the doctor talked about his own childhood. When I was a kid, I was climbing a tree and I accidentally put my hand through a giant hornet's nest. Been afraid of hornets ever since. When the psychiatrist went home, he received a weird phone call in the middle of the night, and then something weird happened. Soon after, Rita attended the doctor's funeral. On the way back, Rita saw the girl's smug look. She began to suspect that the girl was behind all this, so she found the girl's original father. He said there was a demon inside the girl. She uses hallucinations to amplify people's fears. The only chance to kill her is when she sleeps, but she rarely slept. The only chance they had was when they put the girl in the oven. In the end, she was saved by Rita. Rita went to her friends for help, but before she could do anything, the cop was possessed by a vision. The girl summoned the cop's most feared dog and tore into him. He was about to kill the dog when he shot himself. Rita found a photo of her friend at home. She knew that her friend might have been killed. She came to the living room in a rage and flipped over the TV. She demanded that the girl get out of her house immediately. But the girl was calm. Don't yell at me! Rita was horrified at the sight of the devil. Rita retreated to her room and locked the door behind her. Then she brought her bed and put it against the door. But that didn't stop the girl. Rita shivered at the sound of the crash. A little while later, the girl burst in. She didn't want to hurt her. She just wanted to be loved. All she could do was pretend to say yes. Then, when the girl wasn't looking, she made a drink out of sleeping pills. She watched her drink it. In a few moments, the girl fell asleep. Rita poured petrol all over the house. Then she set her own house on fire. Watching the fire, she breathed a sigh of relief. She didn't realize that the girl was outside. Safe and sound, she had underestimated the power of the devil. The next day, they traveled to the town to find a new place to live. On the way, Rita suddenly slammed on the accelerator. She's had enough. She's ready to die with the girl. The girl, frightened, unbuckled her seatbelt and tried to get out of the car. But in the end, it's too late. Rita breaks through the guardrail and drives the car into the lake. The two of them struggle in the car. The girl stops acting like a demon. Rita struggles to get her into the boot. Then he opens the door and swims out. But the demon grabs her by the ankles. She kicks the demon out of the way and swims upstream. And surfaced just as she was about to suffocate. The demon was buried forever in the water. I hope you won't be confused or else you'll meet the demon. Well... I'll see you next time. It's a raffle. Everyone is staring nervously at the screen. The winner gets to go to Paradise Island and live happily ever after. It's the only place on Earth that's not polluted. The Earth's environment is so polluted that all living things can't survive on the surface. All the surviving humans live in close buildings. The only ticket to Paradise Island. The only way to get to Paradise Island is by winning a lottery. But pregnant women who are about to give birth can't go directly to Paradise Island. But they don't know that there was a huge conspiracy behind Paradise Island. Lincoln came to the toilet as usual. The intelligent housekeeper prompted him. The uric acid level is too high, so he should pay attention to his diet. Lincoln was very depressed. If he has health problems, he can't win the lottery. He would lose the chance to go to Paradise Island. So the staff arranged a medical checkup for him. Lincoln was forcibly tied to a chair. The staff held a syringe close to his eyes. Something dripped on his face and crawled in through his eyes. The staff told him the nano machine will help repair the diseased organs. It won't be expelled until the body is completely healthy. After coming out of the medical room, Lincoln came to his workstation. Everyone who lives here has a job. Lincoln's job is to inject these fluids into the catheters in proportion to their size. Where the catheter ends up, they don't know because the work was so boring. Lincoln used to do little things with his computer. And then he'd call the staff, claiming that his work computer was malfunctioning. So, he could go to the maintenance department at the survivor base, to the maintenance department of the survivor base, and find his buddy James to pass the time. On their way back to the workshop, Lincoln found a moth in the corridor. He hadn't seen an animal in years, so he packed him up. At the end of the evening, he broke the news to his best friend. Jordan was also very surprised, because in her mind, that all living things had gone extinct due to pollution, and she couldn't wait to see it. The screen announced the winner of the trip to Paradise Island. Everyone gathered in the hall. Jordan was the lucky winner. Lincoln was happy for her but also sad. He was afraid he'd never see Jordan again. Lincoln couldn't sleep with his anxiety. He got up, looked at the moth in the bottle. He ran out of the room when the staff wasn't looking to find out where the moths came from. He went to the place where he found the moth today, released it, then followed the flight path. After a long climb up the ladder, he finally reached the top, lifting the lid. He found an unfamiliar place up there. To find out what it was, Lincoln waited for the passersby to leave and climbed up quickly. Changes into one of the place's overalls came to an operating theater. The woman in there was the same pregnant woman, but she was supposed to be on Paradise Island. So why was she here? As Lincoln watched, 
Something horrible happened. The staff took the baby and injected poison into the bottle. Within moments, the woman stopped breathing after the crew left. Lincoln went to check on her. Unfortunately, the woman was already dead. At the same time, in the other operating theater, there was also a winner. The doctor operated the machine to cut open the man's stomach. The anesthesia was insufficient and the man opened his eyes. When he woke up, he looked at his stomach in horror. Then he rushed out of the operating theater. The staff behind him immediately fired their weapons. The man was dragged back into the operating theater with a desperate cry. Lincoln saw it all before his eyes. He realized that Paradise Island was a huge conspiracy, and that's exactly what happened. The newborn baby was taken into a room. The nurse handed the baby over to a married couple. The woman looked just like the man who had been poisoned. Lincoln crawled back through the floor. The staff found Lincoln on the video. The chief was afraid that the secret of Paradise Island would be leaked. He immediately called his men to arrest Lincoln. Lincoln found Jordan and told her what he saw. Because she's the next winner, he had to stop it from happening. So he drags Jordan through the basement. He pulls Jordan through the basement, into a pipe, and he accidentally falls down. The two were stunned by what they saw. There were countless human embryos stored here. They were all half-finished human clones. Each clone had a player in front of it. They were fed information about the end of the world and Paradise Island. Before they knew what was going on, the security guards came after them. They had to keep running. In the nick of time, the lift doors opened. The doors closed just as the security guards were catching up with them. They arrived at the upper floors and walked through a corridor. The scene around them changed. The building where they live is also projected. They went to the control room, crossed the corridor, and came to the real ground. Then, they run towards the far side of the building. At this time, the base is welcoming rich people from all over the world. The leader introduces his human cloning program. All the rich people need to do is provide their genes. They can breed clones just like them. They can provide pregnancy and organ transplant services in order to prolong life. The fluid Lincoln injects at work is the nutrient solution for the clones. After the presentation, the chief got a professional company to catch them. On the other hand, the two escaped to a motel. Lincoln found his friend James here. When pressed, James told them the truth. They weren't human beings, they were clones. They were clones created to provide organs to sick rich people. The rich didn't know about the clones, because human cloning is illegal. When they learned the truth, they decided to find their true selves. And, with the help of James, they found the city where the original was located. James took them to the station. He bought tickets for both of them. When they were about to board the train, James spotted a security guard pretending to be a passerby. The two of them ran away and hid in the garage utility room. Security searched the area. When he reached in to open the door, Lincoln rushed out and clubbed him unconscious. Then they boarded the train just in time. It wasn't long before they reached the city of the body. Jordan saw the posters. He knew he was a big star. He's in a coma in the hospital after a car accident. Lincoln then found the home of his body. Lincoln opens the door with ease because he's genetically identical. When they were observing the decorations inside the house, Lincoln's own body suddenly attacked Lincoln. Lincoln's body was shocked when it saw Lincoln. There are two people in the world who look exactly alike. After exchanging views, Lincoln's body has liver cancer. Doctors told him he had two years to live. He spent $5 million to grow a matching liver, but he didn't know the clones existed. Lincoln asked his own body to help him, and the body agreed. He went to the first floor called the cloning company directly. Then he took the suits to Lincoln and prepared to go. Jordan had a bad feeling and told Lincoln to be careful. To be safe, Jordan stayed here. On the way to the police station, Lincoln offers to drive halfway to the police station. The clone company caught up with him. The clones come after him, and the clone reveals its evil face. Lincoln pushes the accelerator to bring the car up to speed. This deterred the clones from firing their weapons. Eventually, Lincoln pulls into an abandoned church. When he gets out of the car, the two of them wrestle with each other, and then the clone company came after them. But since the two men looked the same, they couldn't tell who was their original. Lincoln puts his bracelet on the real Lincoln, and said, I'm the real Lincoln. When the security guard saw the bracelet, he pulled the trigger. The cloning company found out. Lincoln's contemporaries had developed self-awareness, so they decided to destroy them. When it was all over, Lincoln returned home to his original body. He could have lived his life as the original, but he decided to go back and save others like him, because they're all flesh and blood and self-aware human beings. They have the right to live freely. So, the two of them re-entered the base. They split up into two groups, Lincoln to sabotage the facility, and Jordan to save his people. He pulls the switch, but the head of the company finds out. He grabbed Lincoln with a rope gun. He talks too much. Lincoln seizes the moment and kills him. 
At that moment, the whole base suddenly exploded. The world of lies and evil was torn apart. The clones escaped and realized the outside world is not contaminated at all. It was all a lie. Human cloning is a great theme, but Michael hasn't innovated since the third Transformers film. I'll see you next time. Seven-year-old Josh was glued to the board. Thirty-two pieces appeared out of nowhere, and they moved as fast as he could count. In just three minutes, he had the winning move for this century-old game. Night to see it. Yes. And this was Josh's first official game. This talent was discovered during a street game. His mother paid for Josh to play against the king of the park. The old man reluctantly agreed for the sake of the money. Josh took only half a minute to make for moves. It made it hard for his opponent to get back in the game. The old man played a trick to stop Josh's last move. Josh conceded the game with a smile on his face. He loves the process of playing chess, not the victory. The blacks watching the game were very curious about him. What's his name? Josh. The next day, his wife told her husband about the incident, but he didn't believe Josh knew chess. To test his son, he found a chess set. Unexpectedly, just after two moves, the old father started to have trouble. Each move took half an hour. Josh got bored of waiting and ran off to take a shower. Dad thought he had a winning move, and Josh predicted it perfectly. Move my horse in front of my king. You mean your knight? Josh won the game again. The father didn't want to waste his son's talent, so he went to a famous chess master in the area. But no matter how much the father praised Josh's talent, Bruce always said that he hadn't taken on any students for many years. The father had no choice but to take his son away. Josh is now playing against a high-level chess player. The two are playing fast games at an average speed of 5 seconds. Josh is expertly placing stones and ringing bells. Thinking fast, he pushes his opponent to the brink. Josh saw the man's despondency and gave him his favorite sweets. Josh's composure and dedication aroused Bruce's interest. The next day, he went to the park to watch Josh play chess. Josh's father knew it was a done deal. Bruce did approach him. In his club, all the players were obsessed with chess. Some had even won more than one championship. But only Bobby Fischer could be called a genius. He turned chess into a noble art, and Josh showed the same grace. In his first chess lesson, Bruce ordered Josh to break the game. Josh was about to move the pieces, but then he suddenly swept them off the floor. He asked Josh to play blind in his head. The only way to be a top player is to see your opponent's moves in advance. Josh tries to review the game in his head. In a few seconds, he reveals the correct response. Bruce smiles with relief. He carefully pulls his Grandmaster certification out of his purse. For decades, only a handful of people have received this honor. To get it, you have to win all your matches and score a lot of points in your club. And so, the brutal game of chess promotion, in Josh's mind, it became a points game. Bruce took a hands-off approach to the bridge. He didn't stop him from playing or going to the park to play chess. Half a month later, Josh had his first match. All the chess boys in the city gathered here. They play against each other to choose the best of the best. The organizers banished the parents and locked the gates. Luckily, there's live coverage of action. Three hours later, Josh and the other boy were the only ones left. Word came that the boy had eaten Josh's pawn. He comforted Josh's father. Don't you believe it. Your boy will pull it out. Sure enough, Josh cut down the boy's car in five minutes. He probably sacrificed it for position. He's probably still got the advantage. Both parents were particularly nervous. Soon, the boy who passed the message announced that the race was over. But he didn't say who the winner was. By the time the father took Josh home, it was late at night. The headlights made the trophy shine in Josh's arms. From then on, Josh went on a winning streak in various competitions. Within six months, he had won all the U.S. Junior races, and he was ahead in the points. When he returned to school, his teachers warned his parents Josh's studies had been affected. They should cut down on the competitions and help the child catch up on his studies. This sincere advice caused Josh's father to flip out. My son has a gift. He has a gift, and once you acknowledge that, then maybe we'll have something to talk about. He felt that it was a waste to send his son to public school. He wanted to send Josh to a better private school because they had a structured chess program. But Josh was more interested in a slide than chess. The next day, Josh went to the park to talk to Len. He didn't really want to leave his current school. Before Len could say anything, a cheer erupted from the chess stand. The main attraction is a boy about Josh's age. He looked to be as good as Josh at chess when he saw the sharp look in the boy's eyes. Josh knew that he was no match for him, but the boy's teacher was also a rival to Bruce. He deliberately offered the boy to join the club. Then he provocatively threw away the application form. The conflict between the adults puts a lot of pressure on Josh. Chess is no longer a simple pleasure. He asked his father if he could give up the weekly tournament. The Everybody will say, well, of course he won. He's a top-ranked player. But if I lose... 
you won't lose, Josh. The aura of his son made his father lose himself in victory, unaware of his son's unhappiness. On the first day of the tournament, Josh saw the boy in the venue. The moment the two looked at each other, Josh made his decision. The father was being interviewed, receiving compliments as if he was the genius, and to his surprise, Josh was out of the race. The father couldn't figure it out. He kept reviewing the game in the rain. How could his son lose to his opponent in seven moves? Josh just didn't want to lose to a boy, so he gave up in the opening. Why are you standing so far away from me? After this match, Josh seemed to lose interest in chess, but his teaching became stricter and stricter. He demanded that Josh defy his opponents in games. He had to do whatever it took to crush his opponents. Josh was not to play chess in the park again until he won his next game. That kind of game will affect Josh's determination to win. He wanted Josh to be as strong as Fisher, but Josh replied in a non-serious way. I'm not him. He wasn't trying to be anyone but himself. But in order for Bruce to give him points, Josh obediently avoided the park and studied the game carefully. His only remaining goal was the Grandmaster certification. As long as he doesn't get points, he won't play. This attitude completely pissed Bruce off. He slapped the blank sheets of paper on the table. You're on 20. 30. I've got a briefcase full of them. They mean nothing. They mean nothing. Josh realized the things he held so dear were just a bunch of lies. His mother noticed the look of helplessness in Josh's eyes. She takes the child into her arms and orders the teacher out of her house. Bruce stuffs the paper into his bag. To put a child in a position to care about winning and not to prepare him is wrong. Mother tries to get Josh to take a break from training, but the father is putting in a good word for Bruce. He thinks his son is afraid of losing. So he backs off. That's all the justification he needs for tough discipline. An argument breaks out between the couple. The he knows you think he's weak. But he's not weak. He's decent. And if you, or Bruce, or anyone else tries to beat that out of him, I swear to God, I'll take him away. Next day, the father gave in. He opens the door to Josh's room to find Josh sitting at the table, firmly counting the chess moves. His father told him if he didn't want to play chess, he could choose to give up and that he didn't have to win anymore. Jo but I do. I do. Why? Because I have to. Josh finally understood what chess meant to him, and his father finally understands that his son's aura has nothing to do with him. Josh began to play chess the way he wanted to. He came to the park to play against Len. It's not about tactics, but it's about quick reflexes and decisions. He didn't teach you how to win, he taught you how not to lose. That's nothing to be proud of. You're playing not to lose, Josh. You've got to risk losing. You've got to risk everything. You've got to go to the edge of defeat. That's where you want to be, boy. On the edge of defeat. Len taught Josh's best moves. Josh is getting faster and faster. Better, yes. Come on, move. Good. Yeah. All right. Better. Yeah. In the midst of one unrepentant move, Josh managed to improve his talent. He's back in the game with everything new. And of course, there was his fated rival. Though Josh still didn't have the confidence to be him, but he found his own bravery. Josh knocked out 20 opponents at an alarming rate. His performance made the boy quite intimidated. After 20 minutes, Josh came to his side. The two advanced to the final together. On the eve of the competition, Bruce came to visit Josh. Josh told him honestly, he might not win against the boy. This time, Bruce doesn't make a victory speech. He pulls the frame out of his bag and it's a carefully framed masterpiece. He recognizes his mistake. He shouldn't have put his unfulfilled dreams on the boy. His gifts and hugs gave Josh more courage. Josh walked calmly to the ring and pressed the timer. But his opponent delayed and stared at Josh with contempt. Even he releases his piece at the end. Bruce could see that his opponent had carefully laid out a plan to draw out Josh's queen. Josh jumped into the trap without hesitation. Soon after three rounds, his opponent captured Josh's queen. In this situation, Josh still has a chance to survive. To break through, he'll have to count to 12 moves later. But this Josh, who is used to playing fast, remember Bruce's instructions. Bruce has no hope. He's just about to leave when Josh makes his move. He lures his opponent out with a pawn and then reverses the game. There it is! Next, it's a tough defense for the boy. But Josh's speed is forcing him to keep making mistakes. And Josh has clearly seen through his game. The boy won't admit he's lost. He continues to play with his queen. It Check. Eventually, 
Josh takes his cane, the boy had to admit defeat and run away. Everyone gathered around Josh to celebrate. After the game, the two boys took a walk in the woods. Josh consoled him by saying, you're much stronger than I am. Talent is a rare commodity. So is kindness and love. Life is a tough game of chess. Only when you find your own way. That's the only way to get through. That's the end of today's film. We look forward to seeing you next time.